iron or metal and so on, these electron systems, the interaction is very complicated. And if any of you are theorists or budding theorists, you know very well, trying to sit down and describe the magnetism of conventional magnets that you play with is basically an impossible task. I think I should stop people who, are, who do computer simulations and waste a lot of time trying to look at them. What we want to do is to take something simple, take hydrogen. We know hydrogen, we know it very well, we can calculate it to lots of things. Now, what happens if I take a hydrogen molecule which has got A, a nuclear spin, therefore a magnetic moment? I can write down the Hamiltonian with great precision. If I cool it down, I will be able to find a simple magnetic system where I can calculate everything. Well, you can calculate it. I'm getting a bit old for these long calculations, but you can calculate it. You can test magnetism. You can test fundamental aspects of physics if you can get down to very, very low temperatures. So nice, clean systems. Generally, the interactions are weak. They're well understood, well within your grasp. Uh, but, but to look at the changes in phase that they incur due to magnetism, broken symmetry, orbital interaction, I talked about hydrogen. We talked about spin. It's another interaction, right? The two, the two atoms have angular momentum. So the ground state might be spin one or spin zero. There's all sorts of other things, other aspects of broken symmetry that come to play that lead to interesting phases. So that's why we do ultra low temperature physics. Uh, basically, you can attack fundamental questions. What I'm going to do today, I tell you, how do we make temperatures below a millikelvin and stay there, do a real experiment. It, we're not going to talk about taking tiny system, cooling down to a fraction of a microcolon, break the world's records, put a line in Greg Bovinger's list of records. We want to actually have something that you can bring me a sample, you can cool there, stay there a month, and do an experiment. Why a month? Well, there's another price to pay. After complexity, it low temperatures, it's not a surprise that thermal equilibrium is very, very slow. Motion, KT, systems that bring you back to equilibrium are going to be very, very slow. So quite often, the, the time it takes to thermalize something, change the state and measure its properties, waiting for thermal equilibrium may take days. In some cases, it may take weeks. So experiments are long, and you need a lot of patience. So we'll tell you what kinds of experiments are possible, and then how to go. So first of all, let's set the stage. I don't know whether you've seen the slide in, I've got to find a button. Button in this system always eludes me. Let's set the scale for temperatures. All right, where's the button thing? There, okay. So we're, t we're in everyday life here at 300 Kelvin, happy as a whatever you want to be happy as. Um, and, you know, the basic interactions that you understand is for that nuclear reaction. We're talking about 10 to the 9 Kelvin, 10 to the 8 Kelvin, fusion of hydrogen. Um, if you go below room temperature by a factor of 10, you're down to tens of Kelvin. That's when hydrogen becomes liquid, so you're talking about people who use liquid hydrogen to fuel rockets. So hydrogen by itself is quite interesting. Go down another factor of 10, down to a few Kelvin, helium becomes liquid. So these are things that today which are every day. Most superconductors are superconducting around a few Kelvin, some much lower. As Tim said, you can get down to a few thousands of a Kelvin using dilution refrigerators here at the Mag Lab. And what we're going to be talking about is physics way down here when you come down to 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin, 10 to the minus 4 Kelvin. Um, you might think this is not important to everyday life. Here's a map of the, I still have trouble finding this button. It's me, not the machine. Um, this is a map of the temperature as seen by the microwave distribution. You can take this distribution, do a plot. The background <laughs> temperature of, of the universe, that is the co microwave distribution that remained after the Big Bang, is 2.725. Yeah, they, they really believe it. They know it down that much. So that's another thing. Another reason is um, one of the greatest challenges in physics today is to understand the universe what makes up dark matter. 25% of all the stuff in the universe, um, about 
two or three hundred times the amount of baryon matter that makes up you and me. It's made of dark matter. We don't know what it is. Um, but uh, it is one of the, the most probable candidates today is believed to be an axion. I'll talk about it at the end of the lecture. And axions were born cold. They were born non-relativistic. They have masses of microelectron volts, um, or if you like, uh, correspond frequencies, microwave frequencies. They were born cold, and we know dark matter's got to be cold, because if you look up the sky, if you're an astronomer, it's not homogeneous. It's irregular. It's got clusters and bits and pieces. So dark matter must be cold. If it were not, we're neutrinos or the so-called WIMPs. They, would, they are so hot that they would erase the fine structure in the universe. So first of all, all those billions of dollars spent looking for WIMPs and other things were probably a waste of time, a waste of money, because uh, spin dynamics tells you it's probably not what you're going to see. So axions are born cold. Furthermore, you've heard of Bose-Einstein conversation. Axions are bosons. They're born cold. The universe has gone through inflation. They're ultra cold, as far as they are concerned. Um, so they are Bose-Einstein condensed. So the dark matter is a Bose-Einstein condensate. So you see co low temperatures. Understanding thermodynamics of that scale is important, not only for some interesting aspects of magnetism, but also important for understanding the origins of the universe. All right. So you can ask me questions about that at the end if you want to. So, I'm confused. So, how do we produce ultra low temperatures? The first step is you need the biggest, the ugliest, the most powerful dilution refrigerator you can acquire. You need a lot of cooling power. Um, have they been told how a dilution refrigerator works? Okay. So, we're just circulating helium 3, making the helium 3 move from the rich phase floating on top of the dilute phase, forcing the helium-3, making the helium-3 do work against its neighbors. So you can get cooling powers um, of hundreds of microwatts very easily. So we take that as the first step. We connect that to a long sample of very pure copper or another metal. But copper is a nice example because it has nice nuclear spins. The nuclear spins don't interact in order until you get to sub-micro Kelvin temperatures, so it's a good paramagnet. So you cool those nuclei down to, say, 10 millikelvin and 10 tesla. Piece of cake, right? Then you isolate them. You have a little superconducting loop of metal. In our case, it's indium. The aluminum might be just as good. And you make it normal with a magnetic field. It's a good conductor. You turn off that little magnetic field, a little spot, turn it down to zero. And the superconductor, superconductors, although it's a metal, don't transport heat. And you know why, right? It's in a condensed ground state. It's only expectation. There's a big gap between the ground state and the excited state. You don't have any expectation to transport the heat. So it's an infinite fluid, no viscosity, and doesn't transport heat. Interesting state of matter. So we've now isolated our spins. They're all, all the nuclear spins on the copper are all good soldiers. They're all pointing up. And then you start, so the ratio of the magnetic moment to the temperature is a constant. You keep the entropy constant. That's why you isolate the system. Lower B or B over T must stay constant, which is a good power magnet, and we get down to the low temperature. So you can start out with 10 millikelvin, 10 tesla. Let's say I'm not very ambitious. I'll take the 10 tesla, 1 tesla. I'll divide by 10, and then I'll take, say, 10 millikelvin to 1 millikelvin. Or I might get more ambitious and take 10 tesla to a kilogauss, divide by 100, and I'll be down to 0 0.1 kelvin, 0 0.1 millikelvin. That's where the interesting region is, and you can go much further. So let's see. Uh, one of the interesting things is how much cooling. So you make this big piece of metal uh, reach temperatures of, say, 100 microkelvin, 0 0.1 millikelvin. Fine. Then the gentleman at the back comes up to me and says, I, want, I have a brilliant idea to do an experiment. I want to measure the AC resistance of a piece of gold, and I want to oscillate the current at about a milliamp and at uh, 10 hertz and measure the, the conductivity. Sounds like an interesting idea, but I would not say why. Well, we can't do it. 
because if I'm going to put that amount of AC current into a good conductor, I'm going to generate a lot of heat, and we can't handle it. So how much heat can we handle? 20 nanowatts. It's about the best. So you know, like all refrigerators, there's a cooling capacity. You can do an experiment. You'd better think carefully about the experiment and make sure the refrigerator can handle it. So our refrigerators can handle typically 10 nanowatt. We have another one that can go to lower temperatures, about one nanowatt. And yes, somebody asked me, what does a nanowatt mean? Um, the standard answer that we gave to reporters once was it's about the energy dissipated by a typical Floridian mosquito. I don't know what species that is. Uh, probably not a bad one. Doing a one push-up per second. So you can take the weight of, you can do the calculation yourself. You know, not a little itty bitty mosquito, but a good Floridian mosquito. One push up per second, it's about a nanowatt. All right. Well, let's get a little bit more technical about the details. Um, this is just an image of what the system looks like. This is one of the copper nuclear bundles for producing low temperatures. Above here is the dilution refrigerator. This is all about 15 feet long. The experiment's hidden, it's down in here. Here's a cross section. Why is it so complicated? This is the refrigerator here. This, the experiment's down here. So there are two magnets. The magnet to produce the low temperatures by nuclear demagnetization. That's when you take the field on the, the nucleus spin, reduce it, lower the temperature. Then there's a big thermal rod. This is actually a silver, very high purity silver rod down the experimental region. One of the problems, of course, is, well, if I put a big experiment down here, and turn the field on, it's going to upset what the refrigerator is doing. So there's a third magnet not shown here wrapped around here. So that when the experiment is changing the field here, it doesn't change the field up there or vice versa. So it's a complicated magnet system. It's just not one big magnet. Um, it's got to be arranged so that you can, you can uh, move the field around, do some physics here without upsetting the whole system. It's very tall. Then, of course, if we only have a few nanowatts of cooling power, there's a problem. Because if I do that in a building like this, this building is shaking and rattling all over the place. Um, if I take a piece of metal, right, my thermal conductivity from the refrigerator is solid silver in most cases, down to the sample. So that's a very high conductivity piece of metal vibrating in a magnetic field because the earth vibrating, somebody's digging next door. Um, unfortunately, our facility is only 100 yards from the football stadium. So vibration isolation is important. So there's a lot of effort done to isolate this system from everything. And that's what makes us unique in the world. What we did when we built this, we put the whole thing on concrete tripods. These are the concrete tripods whose feet go down another 15 feet into sand. We dug a big hole about 40 feet deep, put in four pads, three pads, for the feet, each one's about five tons. So this is like an oil derrick sitting in a sea of sand. So we're isolated from uh, the rest of the system. And then on top of this, there are still some optical mounts, the kind of things you see for optical experiments to further isolate the vibration. So this whole thing is constructed so the vibrations don't move your sample or your experiment or your refrigerator with respect to um, the magnetic very important. We got a lot of criticism when we built this because it's a tripod. So there's some natural ringing frequencies. People say, well, that's no good. Um, it's going to ring and oscillate at its natural frequency. We say, aha, uh -huh, that's very good. But A, we know what the frequency is, and there may be three or four. And you can actually actively tune it. So you can detect any vibration. If my pointer can find my finger. You can detect that vibration, feed it back, and dampen it down. So that was very successful. Um, people were surprised how successful it was, but um, it, you just have to do it. Well, that's not the only problem. Um, radio waves from the environment, local radio stations, uh, other things you don't know about, um, computer systems. In the age of computers, there's a lot of chatter of RF around here. So the whole thing's also inside a shielded room. This is what's called a tempest quality shielded room. It's just not a, a screen. It consists of walls of soft steel, high magnetic moment, permeability, coated with very pure copper. 
so that actually uh, you get a, about 200 dB of isolation the inside of this and the outside. And we always do this by taking visitors. We have doors, of course, that get in and out, close the doors. Take your best radio receiver, tune into your station, walk in, close the door, no radio signal. Uh, this it creates another problem. Um, if you visit us and you go on one side of the screen room, all the apparatus looks like old-fashioned, and it's powered by old-fashioned batteries. So modern electronic systems with their computer-driven interfaces and so on are wonderful, and great to use, and learning all about them here, we can't use them. You've got to put you know, old-fashioned lock and chart records, all sorts of things that look a bit weird. Um, it's got to be very quiet in some degree. So vibration isolation is very important. Um, even if you're doing millikelvin temperatures, uh, it's a good idea to have vibration isolation. Uh, so let's look at how the demagnetization works. So here I've got a graph. I've borrowed this from Frank Cobell's book on ultra-low temperature. He actually wrote this in Gainesville. He's on sabbatical. It's actually not a very good image. Anyway, if I'm looking at spins, in this case it's copper, but let's say we're going to the all the spins are up, then if they're disordered, equally population up and down, then this is if it was spin a half, this would have an entropy of log two, right? So this is this would be uh, log two joules per mole. If I put on a magnetic field and I shift the spacing, I lower the entropy, put on big enough at, at a fairly high temperature like a few tens of millikelvin, so this is the case of about five tesla, I can drop the entropy down here. So this is the curve for the entropy of the nuclear spins in a magnetic field. I can lower them down here. If I have no magnetic field over here, then the spins stay disordered until you get to a temperature where the spin-spin interaction leads to magnetism. This is nuclear magnetism. You, most of our talks about magnets is all electron physics, electron interactions. We're now talking about nuclear spins. So they order much lower temperatures, in this case, um, down to about 0.1 millikelvin. So this is joule zero. This is high field. Demagnetize down here then open your switch, you're isolated, then reduce B and you end up down here. Of course, if you don't do it very well, you may end up here somewhere. So the trick is to demagnetize very, very slowly. You don't go down to zero. We actually stop at a few tens of millitesla so that you still got a little tiny gap between the spin states. That gives us something to work with because not only do we want to get to those temperatures, we want to be very carefully regulated. How do we do that? Well, when you demagnetize down just say a few tens of Tesla, you've still got some demagnetizing power left. So after you get there, we measure the temperature, you can have a feedback mechanism where you can slowly demagnetize over weeks to keep, if you want to, to keep the temperature very precise. Okay? All right. So, so much for the technology. Uh, here, here, well, just in case the picture wasn't clear before, uh, here is our nuclear refrigerator. Now, in our most powerful case, we don't use copper. We use presidium nickel-5. And those of you who know about nuclear magnetic materials, this has a very large nuclear moment because it's a hyperfine interaction. So this has a very, very large M to start with. Gives us more cooling power. Uh, the price you pay is that it will start nuclear spin ordering at about 180 microkelvin, where you can't get below 200 microkelvin. But actually, users are very happy with that. This is a magnet, a traditional magnet, nosing tin, nosing titanium magnet, can get you up to about 16.5 tesla. So you can do experiments at 16.5 tesla, and I'll show you some results of some. Um, and you can stay cold by continually demagnetizing. You can stay cold for about a month. So this is just a table of what we have. We actually have uh, three stations you can use. The, the, the 
the number just refers to the last one put in place. Uh, this is the Presidium Nickel 5 refrigerator. 10 nanowatts, of course, is what we advertise. Maybe it's 20 in reality. We don't offer to be able to cool down below 0.3 millikelvin, although you can get a little bit colder than that. Pure copper, well, we lose a lot of cooling power, but you can get down to about 50 microfarads. And there are some experiments where you need to get down to that stage. It's not very many, but the field is only about 8 tesla. Uh, we, now, sometimes people propose experiments, and we don't even know if they're going to work at millikelvin temperatures. We don't quite know if the cell design is going to work. So often, actually often means about 60 of the cases, a user will come in with an experiment, will say, oh, we're going to run this at 10 millikelvin just to make sure it works. Does the thermalization work? Do we understand the time constant? So we actually have a fast turnaround facility um, similar to what you have here at the millikelvin facility just for testing this at 10 millikelvin up to about 10 tesla. Um, and it's amazing how much use that gets. People often publish out of it. Um, uh, if they don't need to go below that, well, we send them to Tim and he takes care of it. What can we measure? Well, obviously uh, it's limited because you can't produce much heat on the sample. You can do transport or wire measurements to measure conductivities. Uh, you can measure magnetic, and now we can measure electric susceptibility. Uh, you may have heard about multiferroics, or you may know that from uh, one of the, the great interests in some modern aspects of condensed matter is looking at multiferroic or systems that have magnetism and electricity. So you're breaking time reversal symmetry with magnetism, you're breaking split, you know, inversion symmetry with the electric. These systems, if the magnetism affects the electric polarization, or the electric polarization affects the magnetism, they're wonderful devices. Um, most of them, however, work at low temperatures, so we have systems for measuring susceptibility with such precision. We can do NMR and nuclear quadrupole resonance um, up to about 1.6 gigahertz. Uh, we don't have magnetic fields to do NMR at 1.6 gigahertz, but the NQR can go up to about 2 gigahertz. Ultrasound, um, when you're studying quantum fluids like liquid helium-4, liquid helium-3, sound is a good way to measure the phonons, study the energy gap, study what kind of superfluid you have. And recently, we've been adding pressure capabilities to our portfolio. Uh, so we now have people who can do pressure up to a few gigapascals, so far only down to a few tens of millikelvin. Problem there is actually measuring the pressure at extremely low temperatures. So uh, we need some new ideas there. There's some apparatus to do all these kinds of things. I'll talk about some of the special ones we've made. Um, and then it's, about, it's all very well to say we can make all these temperatures, but you've got to have ways to measure them precisely. Um, the, the workhorse is usually a platinum NMR thermometer. Just to use the NMR snake, I'll describe that a little bit. We also have helium melting curve thermometers, which I'll talk about, and these other things just plain ordinary resistance thermometers, which give a good indication but aren't very reliable. At least not with precision. Okay, if you propose an experiment, um, it will be reviewed externally for scientific merit. But after that, we have to make sure it works. We have to be sure if you bring an experiment to the facility that we know how to thermalize it. We were at very low temperatures, there are no phonons in the sample, there might be some magnetism. How do we get the interior of the sample cold? Um, Many of the times, what we do is we put the sample in a bath of superfluid helium-3. Why helium-3? Well, it's magnetic, whereas helium-4 is not. So we have a thermal contact between the magnetism of the helium-3 and the sample. Uh, helium-3 is mobile. Even the absorbed atoms on the surface of the sample have a lot of quantum mechanical exchange on the surface, so there's lots of quantum mechanical excitation can't rely on thermal phonons, you're, you're at low temperatures. So, but magnetic excitation is still exist. So we often use helium-3, it's expensive, um, it's superfluid, so making cells in superfluid type is a challenge, but um, I think if you talk to users, they'll find that we're pretty successful at it. Uh, the vast majority of experiments need wires, measuring transport, uh, you've got to bring wires down to coils to measure magnetic susceptibility. Um, all the wires have to be heat sucked to the outside world in some fashion. Very hard to, very hard to cool the electrons at these temperatures. Um, and then, of course, there are ground leaks and so on. 
And then, as we say, unless you have data at millikelvin temperatures, we may require that you test it before. So it takes so long to cool these refrigerators down. Uh, we may spend $3,000 of liquid helium just to get a sample of coal. And that's at local prices, which are very cheap. Yes, ma'am. Well, yes, people have asked that question. We had to have one user say, I will not put my sample into the fluid helium slip because he felt the helium atoms might get into it, disrupt the surface interaction, do something. Um, then you're in trouble. And, and uh, if, if, you know, if you've got a sample, say you're looking at heavy fermion, where the interesting materials are the, is the electron degrees of freedom, which are going through the condo effect, uh, how do you couple that degree of freedom? Do you want to cool that degree of freedom down? You don't care about the lattice. Lattice photons have gone long time ago. How are you going to get the coal? You basically need a magnetic interaction, and helium-3 is about all you've got. What's, what's the difference between helium-3? Oh, kilovolts. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's liquid. You're not going to put kilovolts down into these cells. Okay. Little tiny leaks of kilovolts, uh, 20 nanowatts is achieved pretty quick. Uh, we do measure dielectric stability with hundreds of volts in situations where we've made special cases, but it has actually broken down to that. All right. Okay. Um, magnetic stability is, is of great interest. The devices are just what you see in a textbook. We will have a bridge where we have uh, an excitation coil which is creating an oscillating magnetic field right through here. We have two counterwound coils, one with a sample, one with here. So the bridge would give a null, this is just to adjust the bridge, give a null when there's no magnetism in here. And so all of this is at low temperature. Uh, you need a transformer to match to the output impedance. Well, there's a problem here. Transformers usually have some magnetic material in them to make them work. That's not going to work at low temperatures. All the degrees of freedom are frozen. So they're all air-cooled transformers. Uh, there's probably a way to use modern electronics around that, but that's up to the future. These are all superconducting rods, and uh, they seem to work pretty well. Here is a picture of a cell. So this is a typical cell used by a user. Here is a sample down here. It's a few millimeters at most. The other pickup coil has no sample in it. There's the excitation coil. The excitation coil will be a superconductor. These will be pure copper. Um, and then all of this is inside a chamber, carefully sealed. With, you don't see the seal up there. It's usually um, an open um, an epoxy resin. And then the wires that come out go through these devices. These are big socks of sintered silver. And so all of this chamber is filled with superfluid helium-3. All through here, through the sample. All of this, the wires that, that are the pain in the neck, that are bringing hot electrons down, are all cooled by their contents. They have a large surface area between the wire coming in the outside. Okay. As a user, your job is to bring the sample and make sure that we would test this, make sure it works. Our job is to make sure all of this works. And we have several of these sitting on shelves. We often make a brand new one for each case. Uh, so we have a good electronic machine shop that often, you know, we have quite a few of these sitting around that we can use. Um, but the key is the heat exchange of the hot wires, hot electrons coming into the system. Uh, an example of where this led to some exciting new results. This is an example of a Bose-Einstein condensation in an organic quantum magnet. Sounds very fancy, but it's very simple. Uh, this is a material where the interactions are in a spin ladder, spin, 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 and then the connections from the nickel spins, which are the interesting magnetic moments, are separated by an organic molecule. And clever people like Vivian Sapp can change the molecule, stretch the bond, and try and figure out what happened. Um, it had been pretty for a long time that the, the, the nickel spins in these systems would undergo Bose-Einstein condensation. That's very easy to understand. If you look at, at nickel, electronically it's spin one. Ground state actually is a spin zero. The upper state is big gap. 
The upper state is SC, the along the magnetic field, plus one and minus one. Put on a big magnetic field, right? I need, there are no pens here. So I have to wave my hands. So here I have the ground state, it's been zero. Up here is the excited state. There are two states, the doublet. Spin SC plus one, minus one. Big enough field, SC minus one, eventually dies down, hits the ground state. Then a wave function reorganizes, and you've got a magnetic system in the XY plane, and the magnons, the magnetic dissipation of those Einstein condensed. Well, that sounds all very fancy. Um, this is a measure of the magnetic susceptibility as a function of M in terms of temperature. This is the temperature at which these endpoints here, it's a paramagnet. Here it's ordered in the xy plane. When you put on a big enough field, you turn the spins out of the xy plane up to become a ferromagnet. So one was very interested in the critical behavior at these two fields, two tesla, where the onset of transverse magnetization occurs, those ion signs start to happen, and here they're not complete. Um, well, if you're gonna get the critical exponent, you've gotta get down to, you don't wanna find the slope down here. So here is a, if I measure this critical field as a function of temperature down to fractions of millikelvin, this is what you see. So you see there's a very nice straight line. However, if you don't get down low enough, you know, if, you, if you stop at tens of millikelvin, the slope up here, you get the wrong critical exponent. So this is a case where uh, getting down to sub millikelvin temperatures was actually needed to prove it was a Bose-Einstein concept. The critical exponent turned out to be 1.48 plus or minus 0.02 and the, the Einstein prediction, of course, is 1.5 for this three-dimensional spin magnet. Um, people had published earlier that tens of millikelvin, uh, they had gotten a something, they said, in nature, PRLs, ha, ah, these systems are different to Bose-Einstein condensation for an XY magnet, critical exponent is 2.5 or something, um, and we actually said, no, 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 it can't be that. Um, the reviewers come back from Nature. Two of the reviewers said, fantastic, brilliant, publish tomorrow. One guy said, no, no. I don't know if it was a guy or a girl. Said, no, 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 they, they didn't do it right. It's not easy to get all these error bars right. We don't know if they really know the temperature and so on. They've got to do neutron scattering experiments. I think it was a reviewer who realized that it might take a year or two to get the neutron experiments done. And the students were, oh, no, there goes my thesis. It's just going to be another humdrum thesis and so on. And um, so, we talked to our colleague Vivian Zapps at Los Alamos. She said, wait a moment. We can talk to our friends at Los Alamos at Oak Ridge to get that done maybe next month. So we did and sent it back and um, uh, we were vindicated and um, somebody has now to acknowledge that perhaps we didn't have the right stuff. So the lesson is that sometimes if you're looking at critical phenomena, the reason to get to low temperatures is often to explore and understand the ground state. You've got to get down below the critical temperatures, below the, you get to KT smaller than the typical interaction that drives the mechanism. Otherwise, uh, you may come up with the wrong prediction. So don't publish in a hurry. Um, this is a case where the students are very unhappy. They want to finish their thesis and get out and get an exciting job somewhere. And I said, wait a moment. It's best to be right. So don't be in a hurry. Get it right. Listen to your wise men like Eric and Tim and make sure things are nice and and understand. So, so much for magnetic susceptibilities. You can have the same kind of cell. Well, um, actually, this is sort of recent where uh, these same materials, the, the stretching molecule that Vivian Sat put in the system was a thiourea compound, which has an electric dipole moment. So, okay, we've got the nickel spins connected via the thiourea to another nickel spin. That's where the magnetic interaction comes in, but there's something that's polar inside. So the idea was, well, let's see if we can change the magnetic moment by applying electric field. And there was a huge effect. So this is a measure of the polarization as you change the field, and that the critical temperatures you see, here's it, it splits into a doublet transition. It's not fully understood, it's frequency dependent and so on, but there's a strong magnetoelectric effect. So um, whether you can use that in a practical device uh, is another story. But of course, there are, there are partner compounds where these transitions occur not at millikelvin temperatures, but hundreds of kelvin, 
because there you have the opportunity to make interesting devices. Am I might take too much time? Okay. Um, we talked about thermometry. Before I talk about thermometry, uh, our best thermometer is a helium-3 thermometer, but to, make, to use that, I have to make a device that measures pressure very reliably. It's extremely simple. We take just two electrodes. These are the electrodes here. Uh, they're separated by a, a, a very thin film of mylar, and you're basically simply going to measure the, the capacitance. It looks incredibly simple, uh, but how we remember, we want to put this in something of superfluid helium-3, so it better be vacuum type. But basically, you measure the capacitance between two plates. These plates are a few microns apart. What works at room temperature may not work at low temperatures, so the materials you choose are rather important. But you know, we have a collection of these. And why do we use these? Well, uh, here it is uh, the use as a thermometer. Uh, you all learnt in physics 101 or minus 101 that one of the best thermometers for, that you use is a mixture of ice and water, right? As long as it's both solid and liquid, the temperature is very, very reliable. You're at a critical point. You have an accurate measure of temperature. So we do the same thing with helium, right? And helium-3 has a minimum in its melting period. So I make a sill, and I apply enough pressure. Now, you know, for helium make solid, I've got to squeeze it. I've got to change density. There's so much zero point motion, quantum mechanical motion of helium atoms, helium-3 and helium-4, they stay liquid unless I pressurize it. So you pressurize the cell just until you get a bit of solid and a bit of liquid, then you're at a very well-known temperature. Now, there's a melt minimum. This is the melting pressure. So I'm measuring the pressure of a mixture of liquid and solid helium-3. Here's a nice minimum. There's actually a solid line there. You can probably just see that's theory. The red is the experiment. It's very nice agreement. You can actually get the second order correction. Why is there a minimum? Why is there a minimum? Do you see this in other things? Well, we talked about spins at low temperature. At high temperature, the nuclear spins are just log two. They're flat. I really miss not having a pen up here. Yeah. All right. So here is the entropy of the solid. It's basically flat. We're not going to go down until it dies when the spins order the mini film. But it will, will eventually happen. So this is the, this is the entropy of the solid. But the phonons of the liquid, you know, they're basically a simple power law of the temperature. So above this temperature here, which is about 0 0.3 Kelvin, the liquid has more entropy than the solid, but the spins, bless their merry hearts, um, they're not going to start ordering until you get down to nuclear spin ordering temperatures. In this case, it's about a milli Kelvin. So uh, if I plot use this, then there will be a minimum in the melting curve at precisely the point where the two cross over. The reason for the detail is this can be calculated in great detail. The phonon spectrum is very well known. This curve here of pressure as a function of temperature, uh, it has magnetic corrections, but they're very well known. So you have a reliable thermometer. So our workhorse thermometer is a helium-3 melting curve. You have several up here, I understand. Sometimes they leak, they won't work. Um, so what we do is we have a tabletop full of half a dozen of them, test them, make sure they work every time. Once again, uh, it's superfluid helium-3. You've got to worry about leaks. Uh, any wires coming out, you've got to once again have these splintered silver socks with lots of surface area to pull the wires. But that's, that's our best thermometer. It's not the most easy one to use. The easiest one to use is NMR. Um, if you're using a material whose spin ordering, nuclear spin ordering, is very, very low, say picocalvin, that's actually the case in platinum wire, you can use the NMR from the platinum. The platinum spin a half, um, no quadrupole moment. And, and here, after a pulse, at the yellow is a high temperature of three millikelvin. The red is the average response at 0.5 millikelvin. 
the easiest way to do it in the lab is actually just simply, well, a three millikelvin, you're pretty sure from your helium three nozzle curve thermometer that you know the temperature, you set the ratio of these two and find the temperature of the sample. Here's an actual picture of one, some platinum wires coming out, they're welded into a platinum rod, which then is also welded to solid silver attached to your thermometer. Uh, if you're not satisfied with that, um, there, for most metals, the product of the nuclear spin, so this is the nuclear spins. What you're doing here is you kick the spins with a the pulse, they process, this is the precession signal, as long as you do it very precisely every time, it's a good thermometer. It turns out the product of the recovery time times the temperature for almost all metals is a constant. It's called the Korea constant. That's simply because the electrons are thermions, loop sliding across the Fermi surface, number of excitations go to this KT, and that will apply. And the constant is uh, precisely known for every metal. Uh, this is perhaps not the best um, uh, material to use. Thallium would be better from a technical point of view, but being highly poisonous, um, it's also chemically not very stable. We still like to use platinum. But people like Bill Halpern from Northwestern, he likes to think of some other materials. And the reason is, if you get this constant up, then your precision gets a lot better for measuring the temperature. So we've got our thermometers. We know what we're doing. Um, We've talked about NMR. We have a number of NMR capabilities. We do either high frequency using cavities and resonance devices. We can have uh, low frequency systems. So I'll show you a couple. Why would you want to do NMR? Well, if you're ultra low temperatures, most of the degrees of freedom are frozen out. It's not an electron system. You're not talking about electron physics where there's still some electronic magnetization fluttering around. NMR, if you tickle the nuclear spins of your sample, they'll see the local magnetic environment, they're a good probe. If you're doing high field gyro, you know, I keep talking about low temperatures, but uh, what we really do is do work at low temperatures and high field simultaneously. That's why they call our facility the high B upon T facility, and the person who named that, of course, made a tremendous mistake in the naming, which um, I'm gonna ask Eric and Tim not to listen to this discussion. So why is B over T a bad name? What should it be called? We are applying, are we making B? I heard it. Yeah, who said it? What's the difference in B and H? Do you mean they've been through summer school and they, I, I don't know about it. I, we've got to start all over again. This school's got to start again. If you don't, you can't listen. <laughs> You can't leave this building until you can explain to your grandmother or your grandchild or your best friend or your worst enemy the difference in B and H. Who's going to um, right. Do you what? Be quiet, guys. Okay. Okay, you, you'll quiz them before they leave. Promise? Okay. I got you. All right. Okay. So we sort of called the high H upon T. Um, it was pointed out at the time, but um, the people who like things that are nice and, and public relations people said it had to be B upon T. Um, we haven't had any complaints about it, have we? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, we can always change it. Um, so let's have a look at some... some uh, okay, the time running out of time. Um, uh, why would you m measure NMR at low temperatures? This is a measurement of the viscosity of liquids... <coughs> helium-3, helium-4 mixtures. So a superfluid helium-4 now with helium-3 impurities. So if I have two helium-3 impurities, the spins parallel hate each other. They're fermions. The guys opposite, they're in love. They can form states that are bound and so on. So as we cool it down in a field, so this is done up, up to 16 tesla, actually it says 14.8, the viscosity increases dramatically below the temperature. This is just exponential NMR shift over KT. Viscosity, and we actually, and of course, yeah, there was the naysayers. They said, well, you use it. We used NMR to measure relaxation time. Relaxation of a poor little atom moving in the fluid is just the viscosity with a few theoretical corrections and so on. So somebody said, no, 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 we don't believe your NMR theory and so on. And the people, the chemists who think, you know, all they do is NMR is all the structure. They don't understand the dynamics and how 
and my relaxation loop. So I said, okay. We made a little SubNet wire little loop, put a little AC current in and vibrate like a paddle. And we measured the viscosity. And the amplitude was slightly different, but actually at low temperatures, there's not much difference. High temperatures, it's actually a little bit of a difference. That's okay. By the time you get up to high temperatures, the phonons and so on, you're starting with the paddle to measure the phonons as well as measure the viscosity or motion of the spin. So dynamics at low temperatures can be measured with NMR. That's why we do it. Uh, here's a, um, it's much easier at low frequencies. Low frequency may mean low B, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we have cross coils because if I have 20 nanowatts of cooling power, most people can't do NMR at low temperatures because they use a pulse, right? You put a pulse on, check the spins, look at the precession. That's how you measure the NMR signal. I can't put an RF pulse on at one millikelvin, check the spins right over. I can just get a little kick, too much heating. So you've got to have very clever devices to isolate the heating of the RF coil from the system. In this case, the outer coil, I've lost my symbol again. This is the outer coil. We let this one get hot, but inside is another pickup coil. So that's the excitation inside the pickup coil. These, they're oriented mutually perpendicular. We let the, this is nested so that the outside, we don't care if it goes up to a Kelvin or so. But the inside sample, which you can't quite see, is this is the solid silver coming from the top from the refrigerator. This is just electronic to tune things. Uh, there's a, a solid silver plug that goes in there. The sample's right inside. That stays cold. The outside, because of poor thermal conductivity, can go up to a Kelvin without too many problems. So we have tricks to make NMR. Here's a little sketch. So in this case, there is the sample. It's sitting on a plug of solid silver, silver powder in the center. And then this is welded silver all the way up to the top. And so here is the pickup coil. Here's the, this coil, cross coil goes in this direction. So B, pickup coil is along this axis. Excitation coil is along the Y axis. So there are tricks you can use. Uh, even then, you can't, you can't put a one watt pulse on these coils and still expect to stay at millikelvin temperatures. At high frequency, we take the sample in a little finger and put it in a resonant cavity. So the walls of the cavity might get warm, warm being a Kelvin or so but the finger inside can stay at sub millikelvin. So you can do NMR at very low temperatures, measure dynamics, measure magnetism, but you need to go from two solar. I'll skip over some of these. Uh, here's a case of measuring transport. Here's a an example of the cell. Our standard construction you've seen before, but this time it's on a rocker. So there's a hydraulic uh, bellows here. We fill this up with, this time, superfluid helium-4. Change the pressure, you can make this piston move up and down. It's on a rocker, so you can actually rotate the sample. The sample here can rotate in one place. And that, so th in this case, it was used to discover the five halves fraction plumb Hall effect. It's now well known, and well established at this day and age. Um, but by rocking it, you could actually prove that you have a true plumb Hall effect at even denominators. So um, it only manifests itself below about 15 millikelvin. There's a proof of it. Um, this also sounds possible. I think I'll start getting close to wrapping up. Um, this is where we are. So this is a plot of all the facilities field. So you know, the hybrid's up here somewhere. You go out to Los Alamos, it's much higher field, but not very high low temperatures. Um, what interests us is the ratio of B over T, or H over T. Uh, we are here in Gainesville. We'd like to get up to there. Uh, the this, the orange is good. Uh, up here, crimson is good, but just imagine that crimson. Blue is not so interesting. So we want it. Physics is up here. The new physics are looking at correlation, highly correlated electron materials, fractional quantum Hall effects, quantum field and solids. It's all up here. So you want to be up here somewhere. The record for beer pond tea is still in Gainesville up here. It's pretty close with Helsinki and others. But China has lots of money. They actually also have a presumed nickel five. They also have 10 nanowatts of cooling power. Uh, they only need to change their magnets and they could pass this any time. And I keep reminding everybody about this. Um, and either the NSF does something about it, or if you want to do experiments up there, you might need to learn some Mandarin.
All right. Um, I was going to talk about axons, but I'm going to stop here. You can ask me questions about it, um, or we can go on to the next stage, I see. But I'm well over my time limit. I'm going to get thrashed, but it um, won't be the first time. Yes, um, uh, if you can't, cross coil is the best way to go. It works up. You can do that up to about 30, 50 megahertz. Um, above 100 megahertz, we use cavities. So it's just a resin, instead of a coil, it's a resin cavity. And remember, the key is for the making the RF magnetic field to do the NMR, we don't care if the coil or the cavity gets relatively warm. And then we put a little hole in it, starts destroying the key, but it doesn't need a big key. And then a sample um, might be inside superfluid helium-3, and then it'll poke into a little tiny poke, a little finger that goes into it. Um, I had a picture of one which I skipped over. See if I can find it quickly without getting into trouble. There. So here's a case where there's a resin cavity the cavity is up here, this complicated structure. The cold sample is way in there. The little cold finger goes into there. That's attached to a silver blaze spot thermometer and so on. So you can do, it's easier at higher frequencies. Um, at least as far as the construction is concerned. You had a question. That's separate. That's separate. Good point. So he, his question is, we, we've got our nuclear refrigerator up here, okay, uh, a little bit higher than I can reach. There's the copper or the precision nickel five. We're changing the D there, H there, change the precision. Then there's a long silver roll down to another 12 feet in the sample and a new magnet. So you can change the field up there to keep the temperature regulated, but the field there stays constant because we're going to douse. So you've got to have the separation. Very good point. That I, I just can't go up here to Mark Bird and say, make me a magnet, you put it in there. You have to have a magnet system, one for demagnetizing, one to do the physics, and then another coil in between that senses any change in one for experimental mag and corrects. So there's a co compensation coil in between. Very important. So then you have a two system. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's why we're so. That's where the time comes. That's where the time comes. Well, the time comes in to start to cool the system. Like you've, you've got a, um, a large, it's not exactly the world's best cryostat, but it's pretty good. Um, but you, you've got a, two big magnets plus a compensation cord to cool down. It takes about a week or two just to get cold and get done with. And then, of course, something may wire snap, things go wrong, bumps occur in the middle of the night. And But it's our job, so for users, it's our job to make the temperature work. We've got, we've got two stations running at very low temperatures. Hopefully, with the renewal, we may get another one running. Because um, the bad news is, um, you get your experiment accepted, uh, we've got a queue of people waiting to do experiments. You know, they'll come down and fight to get, get in the queue. It's nine months long. So your experiment gets accepted, unless it's going to win a Nobel Prize and you recognize that, um, Eric will allow me to jump the queue. I always do tell you, don't I? Hey, don't answer. Yeah. But, but we can actually, for a good reason, I will actually usually go and make sure that, that somebody up here says, you know, back this up. We, c we, ha we have, on occasion, jumped a person over the queue because it's such an exciting experiment. If it works, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be you know, a major uh, event. You have to do that, otherwise, you know, you know, they'll go to China and do the experiment. And, you know, and I can't have that. Uh, it's, uh, the NSF will get very angry with me. Actually, I wish they would get angry.